Now we're fighting the remnants of the Ottoman Empire. When the Ottomans fell, radical Islam expanded into the Middle East, Wahhabism. Some of you may have heard the term. Wahhabism is, the, is a very radical fringe view of Islam in the Quran. It is, but it was the vehicle by which the Saudis took power in the Arabian Peninsula. And to this day, the Saudis are exporting Wahhabism through their madrasa schools. I call them the McDonald's of Madrasa. Because when I was Peace Corps country director in Malawi, Africa, this was back in the late 80s, I was watching the Saudis come in all over East Africa, all over Central Africa, building mosques, building madrasas, bringing in Wahhabism, and we did nothing about it. And, of course, the run-up to 9-11 included the embassy bombings in East Africa. And someone needs to confront the Saudis and tell them to stop exporting hate. Nobody's doing that. The main reason is because we are still addicted to oil. And when you look around the world, there are solutions to basically using mulch dinosaurs. One of which is the French are using 76% of their power is nuclear. We don't have to study nuclear energy. We can go and get the kind of packet plants that uh, the French are using. In fact, the American companies have developed these new technologies that are far cheaper, far more environmentally safe, far uh, more cost effective and energy efficient. And they're plopping them in all over France, all over Western Europe. We can bring them back to this country. We can retrofit our existing nuclear plants. The other is hydrogen fuel cells. We don't need to study alternative energy. You go to Iceland, 50% of the vehicles in Iceland are running on hydrogen fuel cells today. The whole issue is distribution systems. You start with bus fleets, taxi fleets, uh, other kinds of fleet management for corporate America. We can get hydrogen fuel cells out there within a couple of years and start to bring that into the mix in the United States. So this whole thing about 10, 20 year studies, 10, 20, 30 year goals, subsidies, again, it's back to management by press release. The other part is Let's look at the demand side, and I'm not talking about squiggly light bulbs. I'm talking about the fact that in this day and age, a vast majority of, of white-collar America gets up every morning, sits in their individual cars, and goes into a cubicle, and they sit in front of a computer screen, which they could have sat in front of back at their home. The, and government talks a good game about home officing. They don't do it. There's actually lots of fighting about it because they like the command and control structure. They like to have bosses looking out overseas of cubicles. So in my book, it's not only time to remove the dinosaurs in our tank, it's time to remove the dinosaurs in our offices. The other challenge is internal. We really have a crisis dealing with our own civic culture. And this isn't about immigration or diversity. This is about the fact that we are raising a generation that doesn't know where Canada is, that doesn't know the Constitution from the Declaration of Independence, who doesn't even understand that there are three branches of government. I mean, one of the, I was in on the initial task force that helped design the uh, new visitor center for the US Capitol. One of the main reasons was not security, because this was long before 9-11. It was because the guides to the Capitol building had to first explain this was not the White House. They then had to explain there were three branches of government. They then had to explain there were two houses of Congress. And this was two Americans they were having to explain this. So the visitor center was initially designed to just educate our own citizenry about what they were about to walk into when they were on tour of the Capitol building. In West Virginia, and West Virginia is the 50th in the country on education, so, take, you know, so put that in context. But right now, civics is an elective at, in West Virginia high schools. Think about that, an elective instead of a requirement. So we're literally at a point where we're losing our collective knowledge. We're also, also uh, Basically, uh, one of our big problems is our success. You know, we have hundreds of cable channels. We have millions of websites. 
and that is a good thing in terms of communication and accessibility, but it's a bad thing in terms of that we are losing our collective reference. People are getting their news not in any consolidated way. Somebody's watching Jon Stewart, somebody's watching Fox, somebody's just going on the Drudge Report on TV, on, on the web. And so there's no collective frame of reference anymore for us to process new information and current events. And there's no collective memory because we're, we're not teaching history in schools, we're not teaching civics. So think of this, there's only one place currently existing in this country where the collective memory is still intact, and that's our 388 units of the National Park System. But currently, under this administration, it is being underfunded at $600 million a year, and there's over a $5 billion backlog in maintenance of existing parks, and every day, acres upon acres of historic property vanish because of suburban sprawl and other development issues around the country. If we don't maintain who we are, we're going to lose who we are. And the challenges of the 21st century are already upon us. So when we are out there in various candidate forums, when you're talking to your county commissioner, your congressional candidates, your Senate candidates, governor, and certainly the presidential level, we need to ask them what they're going to do about these things. No presidential candidate has risen above the clatter and clutter of short-term fixes. They have not talked about how America is going to survive as a viable democracy in the 21st century. If they want to lead us, they need to tell us their vision for preserving who we are and assuring future generations will enjoy the freedoms and the liberties that we do today. And so with that, I'll uh, open up to questions. Thank you. There are, there are pieces of paper on the table. If you'd like to ask a question, please write it down. We've got some volunteers walking around who can collect those and take them up, and I will do my best to get to all the questions, and there are always a number. Uh, a couple of questions I want to combine that I already, uh, already have gotten. Uh, there's an organization that we've actually tried to get a speaker from called Unity 08 or Unity 2008. The, the basic premise is to have a Democrat and a Republican run on the same ticket for the President of the United States. And I'm going to tie what you think Number one, do you think that would ever happen? Number two, do you think it would do any good? And uh, I'm going to actually tie it to this question. Do you think the partisan squabbling in Congress will ever cease? <laughs> well, again, there's, there's too much uh, PAC money to be garnered and too many uh, media minutes to be uh, uh, gained by uh, not squabbling. So, I mean, the key is, is they, they're there's always going to be squabbles because people are playing to the crowds. And as long as uh, the various cable shows book the more polarizing people on their shows, as opposed to the more reasonable people, we're going to have this problem. And right now, we're rewarding abusive partisanship because that makes for better, better ratings. I mean, just like people watch uh, all these reality shows. I mean, the more people can eat crazy bugs and uh, jump across mud flats, uh, the more ratings they get, and Congress understands that, and they play to the crowd. In terms of bipartisanship, I think that a, a Republican and a Democrat running, again, it gets back to who it is. I mean, one of the big problems we're facing in the 08 election is that both parties have ceased to be parties. We have cults of personality. 